Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi there. I'm Tina Carter, an alcoholic. And uh, I want to thank... Um, Larry, where are you? I didn't get to meet you. Are you here? Is Larry here? All right. Okay. Somebody thank Larry for me. And, uh, but I want to thank all of you, uh, for, uh, having me and Vanessa here. I want to thank Vanessa for, uh, joining me and, um, sharing her experience, strength and hope. Um, and, uh, let's see more business. Happy birthday, um, to Desiree. And where are you? I just want to look at you. Where are you? She left. Okay. Well, happy birthday. And then um, welcome to all the newcomers. And then, um, and I especially want to welcome you if, um, if you're in this room and you are dying on the inside. I especially want to welcome you. I want to welcome you if you have a lot of time and you're dying on the inside or if you're brand new and you're dying on the inside. Because that was my story for a long time. Um, in Alcoholics Anonymous, and it's kind of come and gone a little bit uh, uh, in my early recovery, for sure. But um, but my my uh, my heart is especially attached to those um, those folks. My um, sobriety date is uh, June sixteenth. Everybody's playing with this, so I feel like I need to. I just wanted to <laughs> play with that. So there. What you just woke up? June sixteenth, nineteen ninety five. That's my sobriety date. And that's your sobriety date. It's your belly button. I'm, thanks for letting us know. And, um, and, uh, and I have a sponsor, and her name is Joy. And, uh, and I have a home group. It's uh, um, on Wednesday night. It's a, a women's step study meeting, and it's in Seal Beach. And uh, those things have become pretty important to me um, a long time ago. Um, uh, and, uh, and I sponsor some women and they've become important to me. And I actually, um, have a group of friends, um, in Alcoholics Anonymous that I can call, um, and, uh, and I can count on and I trust, I trust that, uh, they will see me, uh, uh, they'll see through me actually all the things that I can't see. And that's why I reach out to them today. And I'm saying all of that, uh, because all of those things did not matter to me at all when I got here. Um, and I wouldn't let them matter to me for about the first three years that I was here. So um, uh, I will tell you uh, what it was like, what happened, and what it's like now. And I'll do my best to get drunk, um, uh, of course, in this story so that I qualify. But I do want you, uh, I'm going to give you a little disclaimer. You're going to be, need to be a little bit patient for that. All right? Um, uh, I love Vanessa's story. Um, because I love to hear the similarities, and so I want to encourage you to listen for those as well. Um, I was uh, born in an alcoholic family, and I can say that because the majority of them are in Alcoholics Anonymous. They have a lot more years uh, than I do, and um, I'm the youngest. I have three older brothers. Um, I've never lived with my father, never known him. I saw him a couple of times, but other than that, uh, I I never knew him. my, uh, I never really lived with my whole family uh, at one time due to the alcoholism in my family, but I did live with my mom uh, mostly and uh, with the two sisters. So my mom had two sisters. And, um, and uh, it, growing up, um, they, they're, they're German, and uh, I don't know what that means except that I feel like I'm compelled to say. They're singers, basically. And so what would happen on holidays when we would all get together, I'm also the youngest out of all of the cousins, um, the three sisters would get together and and sing and cook and sing in the kitchen, three-part harmony. It was a lot of fun. My family was a lot of fun growing up. Um, uh, Very loud and funny and um, hyper and uh, all of that. And, uh, but around two in the morning, um, the three sisters would, that were singing in three part harmony would break out into these, the three part fights. They would just fist fight and pull hair and put dents with their bodies in the refrigerator and things like that. And it got real loud. Um, uh, I can summarize, um, the temperature, uh, the emotional temperature growing up to being, um, very loving and, uh, very funny, but also very violent. Um, and very full of alcoholism. And the violence and the, um, 
the other abuse was always made up for by the love because we loved each other intensely. And I know now that we just, uh, we might have had some uh, unhealthy ways of showing it to each other. But, um, but you could always count on if something bad happened within the family um, that, that we showed a lot of love for each other. Um, so there really wasn't a whole lot of doubt um, uh, in those moments. Um, my mom... Uh, when she was uh, an active alcoholic, she would, um, she was a single mom, and uh, like I said, and she couldn't have us all in the house, and so we were split up. Some, was, some, uh, a couple brothers were in foster homes, and uh, one was old enough to to move out, and I just don't remember uh, uh, a lot about where they were at, but I know where I was at. Uh, when my mom would, went to go, you know, out for the night, she would drop me off. So she would drop me off at maybe a friend's house, a new friend's house, an old friend's house, a cousin's house, a, a family member's house. And, and the expectation, of course, is that she's going to come later on that night and pick me up. And many times uh, she would come the next day to pick me up. And there were also uh, many times that she would come a week later or she would come a month later. And one time she, she picked me up after an entire summer went by. Um, when I would go home with her, um, it, we would oftentimes go to a new apartment because she had lost the apartment, but I didn't know, you know, the reason. I just knew that we were in a new apartment. And uh, we would have new furniture and new toys and all that kind of things because of St. Vincent de Paul and Goodwill and the Catholic Church that I grew up in. And, um, and, uh, and so there, were, there was a lot of change. And, um, and for me, you know, uh, I can't say that I knew that that was different. I knew that I was different. I knew that when I showed up to school for as long as I could remember, I felt different. And I want you to know it's really important for me to communicate the, some of the things that I've learned by doing steps over and over again in Alcoholics Anonymous and listening to people, you know, tell their story and, you know, and share their solution because that's what we're here for. Not just to identify, but uh, for me anyways, I come here to get solution, you know. And um, I didn't at first. Right. The first thing I came here for was to not drink. And that's a good start. Um, And so. uh, um, So I don't look back and um, see myself as someone who uh, felt like she didn't fit in because of those things. I I just didn't fit in. I just remember not feeling like I fit in. It wasn't until later that I started to put some of the pieces together and, and, and have a difficult time showing up because I was ashamed of, you know, what was going on at home, right? Um, I know that things were just too busy to have friends over, and I know that things were just too busy for me to go to friends' houses. Um, but the beautiful thing that I had, and I know that a lot of us have, is an imagination, and so um, when I was at, uh, most of my time was spent at my, uh, my grandmother's house, and she had this huge table. And uh, this table was, I mean, you know, when you're small, things seem a lot bigger, but it just seemed like it was miles long, and it had this huge um, uh, uh, cover on it, you know. Um, someone give me the word. Thank you. Tablecloth. <laughs> I overshot, I, I, on our drive over here, um, I alcoholically overshot the mark on my coffee. And so I'm like, my story is over there and I'm trying to catch up. But um, anyways, the tablecloth, it was so big that it went to the ground. And so underneath, I would go underneath the table and spend a lot of time in my imagination. And, uh, and underneath that table, I would take my toys, I would take my brother's toys, I would take... You know, if the neighbors had toys that I liked, they'd sneak into their yard and take their toys and, and just go underneath that table and go into my own world. And uh, uh, my favorite were the little army men. I mean, I had some Barbie dolls, but my favorite were the little army men. Just a couple of years ago, uh, my best friend gave me a set of those army men for my birthday, and it was pretty much one of the best birthday presents I've had in the most recent years. <laughs> it's just a bag of those little green army men, you know, and what I did with them was I created a world, I created a life, you know, I had the band, does anybody remember what those look like, do you remember the guy who's on his knees and he's like that, right, well, he was, um, uh, he, no, he, yeah, he's a sharpshooter, but in my imagination, he was a trumpet player, and then, uh, and then there's the guy with the radio, right, he's like doing something, he's got the radio over here, do you remember that guy, right, the old grenade and a radio, he was the drummer, and then, uh, and then, um, 
That's right. Mm -hmm. And then the guys that were laying down, I could never figure out what they were, so I took them out of the scene. But everybody else, oh, oh, my favorite, because I am a guitar player, my favorite was the guy who had his weapon like this. Right, remember? He was the guitar player and the lead singer, by the way. Yeah. And, uh, and so I would, they would just, the band would be playing and the families would be going on and, and, and I would just have, it would just go on and on and on and I would live in my imagination. And um, when I went to school, I couldn't talk. I couldn't talk. Um, uh, I, I would talk when necessary and, um, and whenever I did talk, it was at the wrong time. And, uh, you know, so sometimes I was a little bit hyper, but, um, but I couldn't talk. Um, and that went all the way through high school where I was just so incredibly shy. I had such a difficult time just being in my skin. And I did not know how to put words to that until I came here. But, um, but I was just incredibly, incredibly shy. Um, I, I also relate to the statement that, you know, I just didn't want to be here. Now, you know, when I was a kid or in high school, it wasn't about suicide. It wasn't about wanting to die. It was just not wanting to be here. And, and there were two things. There were two themes that have really run through my whole life, including uh, in sobriety, if I'm not careful. And that is when I get there, so always living in the future, when I get there, it's going to be or it's too late. I remember being 17 years old trying to make a decision for college and and realizing it's too late for me at 17. You know, it's just too late for me. And uh, and that was, uh, and so I made some different decisions in my life. Um, So um, I was just incredibly uncomfortable and uh, and didn't didn't know how to connect, you know, with friends and things like that. And, um, but with family, you know, I could be myself, and uh, and at home I was in the opposite. I was extremely hyper, and you know, seeking attention and all that kind of thing. Um, when I was in high school, uh, I am getting to that first drink. I mean, the the sips. Uh, uh, I guess I shouldn't make the assumption that I you know had tasted alcohol with all that alcohol around, but um, but I didn't have a drunk until um, high school little late bloomer. I'm in the uh, senior year and, uh, but I, but I did look back and figure out that I had some alcoholic thinking already going on. Um, I was just somebody who needed a drink for sure. Um, you know, the, the book tells us, um, that we have, um, we have an allergy of the body, right? And we have an obsession of the mind. And all I know is back then I had (laughs) some serious obsessions of the mind. So you can call that a predisposition. I don't really know. I don't really care. I just know how it was. And uh, at some point in high school, I got um, the obsession of prom. It just felt like prom was something really important. I was hearing the buzz about prom for years, you know, the four years of being in high school. And as it approached senior year, I was getting really stressed out. Um, As far as sports go, I always played sports um, uh, during... Uh, grade school. When I got to high school, uh, I made the um, junior varsity basketball team as a freshman. And the first uh, the first game, I showed up for the game, and uh, there were people in the stands. And people didn't really they weren't really in the stands when I was in grade school. And so I quit <laughs> because I it was so uncomfortable to be seen. I just couldn't do it. And I also couldn't talk about it. I couldn't tell you why I did that, but I quit. And so I joined cross country because that's that was like solo. That's a solo job right there. And, um, and I would go to school late on Monday mornings because I placed oftentimes in those races and they would announce the people who placed. And I wanted to show up after, um, they made those announcements because that's how shy I was. And that's how uncomfortable it was to be in my skin. I did not want you to even look at me. And, um, but I needed to go to prom and I didn't know how I was going to solve this problem because, you know, there's two things people are going to ask you for the rest of your life. I'm sure as adults, you know, this one is, you know, what college did you go to? And the other one was, did you go to, did you go to prom? Some of you are just staring at me like, what is she talking about? You just like came back to the room. But did you go to prom? Seriously? So, I mean, that's what, you know, I thought. And so I stressed over it for four years. And then finally in the senior year, someone asked me to go to prom. And, uh, and, oh, my God, I just thought, you know, I may not go to college, but I'm certainly going to prom. Thank God. And, um. And uh, the thing about it, the reason why I bring it up is because, uh, number one, it lets you kind of know how my thinking was. But two, I don't remember anything about prom. I didn't get drunk. I did not get drunk. 
but there's nothing about that night that I remember. And I'm saying that because I want you to be clear on the amount of fear that I lived in, which I feel is alcoholism. That's the amount of fear that I lived in, was that I cannot remember prom. I have a picture of it, but I cannot remember being there. I don't remember a thing about it, you know. Um, but I went. That night, Mike... Uh, the guy that asked me out, apparently made uh, these arrangements with my then sober mom who, um, uh, that we were going to have some, uh, some uh, champagne. And so as long as he parked in front of the apartment and then opened the bottle of champagne, we were allowed to have this. And, uh, and I thought, all right. And, uh, and so he opened this bottle of champagne and he had a little bit and I had the rest. I just had the whole bottle. <laughs> like it was just, it was so good. Like, and, uh, and I drink like that today. You know, if, if it's like lemonade or whatever, I mean, you can have a little bit, but I'm going to have the rest. It's just, it was that good. And, uh, and I got, um, obviously really drunk and, uh, you know, the, the car was maybe 10 feet from the apartment door. I walked in and, and, uh, and my, my mom was there with some years of sobriety and my brother was there as a newcomer in AA and we all laughed. That's what we do. You know, we're just, we just laughed. We saw the humor in it and my mom helped me out of my dress. She had earlier that evening helped me into it and, uh, and, and it was just a lot of fun. And I woke up the next day realizing what the problem was. I should have drank in freshman, freshman year. You know, I would have had a totally different experience in high school had I just been drinking. You know, graduation was around the corner. I made it to graduation. But the new obsession in my mind was how can I move so that I can drink? It was just really that simple. I'll back up a little bit. My mom got sober when I was in third grade. So, um, so there was all that moving and all that stuff was happening up until third grade, up until I was eight years old. And my mom got sober. And what had happened during that time was uh, some stability came into my life, some structure. You know, all of a sudden there was uh, dinner time and there was homework time and there was getting ready for tomorrow, packing my lunch for tomorrow time. And um, I was not having it. You know, I was a relatively good kid, but I was just not having that. I thought you know, and all of a sudden I'm hearing things like, you know, yeah, AA taught me how to be a mom. And I'm thinking, you know, I have chores too. And all this, it was awful. And, uh, and, uh, that was abuse. Um, uh, that was a joke, but, um, anyways, um, so the thing that changed was instead of, um, dropping me off to go to the meet to, uh, to going out, uh, she either was dropping me off to go to a meeting or bringing me into uh, the meetings with her. And I know that uh, a lot of us in here have experienced that. One of the common things, you know, in early sobriety is when we get sober, the, you know, our family and friends that love us and wanted us to get sober so badly start to get a little bit angry at us because now we're still gone, you know, going to the meetings. And I was certainly angry at her for doing that. And so I was going, you know, at the beginning I was in Alatot. uh, in Phoenix. And then after Alatot, I was in Alateen until I could you know, break away from that and just not go with her anymore. Uh, but there were times that it was sitting, in the, sitting in the meetings. And this is what I can tell you that happened for me in the meetings. Um, I would sit in the meetings and I would hear the stories of these, of you, you know, uh, sharing from the podium like I am right now. And what was happening was the people that were sharing were telling my story. And I understand that they were telling my mom's story. I, I learned that later, but when I was in there, they were telling my story. And, and I was mortified. You know, uh, it's, it's so interesting what a kid can remember and think about. And I can remember vividly sitting in those meetings totally full of shame because my story was being told from the podium. And then after that, you laughed. You all laughed. And what I didn't know was that's us identifying with each other and find freedom in that today. But when I was eight years old, it wasn't funny. And that was my first resentment, my first hardcore resentment. I hated you. It was you that I hated. I would have rather traded that experience for her to go back out and drink. Because you were telling my story. And that was mine to tell. It was my secret. Do you understand? And so I was never going to be like you. And now fast forward back over to being 17 and I have my first drink and my new obsession is, uh, except the exception in my mind is I'm not going to become one of you, not knowing that it's already happened. 
that all I'm doing is thinking about alcohol, that all I'm doing is planning on moving out as a 17-year-old with my cousins, and my mom gave me permission because I was a good kid, you know, so that I could drink. And I did. So I spent that summer drinking every day, every night. And it was the greatest thing. I just felt like an adult. I'm sitting around the table with my cousins, and we're just drinking to oblivion. You know, not going anywhere, not getting in trouble, just sitting there drinking to oblivion. And it was great. Um, Occasionally, we did go some places. And one night or one morning, I remember that the night before, I looked up. uh, All I could remember from that night was looking up and seeing a red light than that I had been uh, driving right through a red light. And nothing happened. I didn't get an accident. But I knew what that was. I knew what that was because they sat in these meetings. That was called a blackout. And I knew that if I had a blackout, I was going to become one of you. And I was so not going to become one of you that I stopped immediately. I stopped drinking. And what I did was join the Army because <laughs> that's what you do. So I joined the Army uh, so I could get money to go to school. Um, I also want to say that, um, you know, uh, another memory that I have that, uh, that really isn't a memory, it's almost part of my being, is I'm a big God fan. You know, I never really had any issues with God. I was, you know, I came into the world, and it's like uh, I was taught that the sky was blue, um, and there's God. And I never had an issue with whether there was God or not. Um, uh, the only thing I had an issue with was there was only one kind of God, and that was the God that I was born into this world with. Does that make sense? And, um, and that kind of switched a little bit. I grew up in Catholic school, and I'm not a recovering Catholic. I don't have, I'm not a recovering anything other than a recovering alcoholic because I honestly don't have a problem with any of those things. My experience was I was a, a fan of God, so I could adapt. You know, I went from a Catholic school to, while in a foster home, I went to, you know, a Christian church. Um, and then from there, you know, I took myself to church and, um, and continued to pursue this relationship with God as I knew God at the time. And, uh, so when I came back from the army, I went to broadcasting school and got into broadcasting and I went into Christian radio for 10 years, you know, and I also became a Christian musician and I led people to the Lord. And, uh, and the only thing, you know, uh, that, uh, that, you know, I can say is that I wasn't good enough to, to get the, the uh, gifts of the Spirit. Um, one of them was speaking in tongues. And there was this one, um, this one church uh, that, you know, did the speaking in tongues. And I'm, please know that I'm not making fun of anybody here who I, I have respect for all of that. But I want you to get the alcoholic in me uh, really well, that, that I can adapt, right, to any environment. Um, and, and so, you know, I'm here and I'm trying to lead people to the Lord and trying to have all these gifts of the Spirit and and I can't speak in tongues, and so I know, you know, once again, I don't belong. And uh, But before they kick me out, because I'm just assuming that it's a matter of time uh, or I'll just go, is um, i got to figure out how I'm going to speak in tongues. And so I started listening, and it sounds something like this. She sold a Honda. It also sounded like, oh, my shin, like my shin, oh, my shin. And so then I just started saying that fast. Oh my shin, oh my shin, oh my shin, oh my shin, oh my shin. She sold a Honda, she sold a Honda, she sold a Honda, she sold a Honda, she sold a Honda. She sold a Honda. Oh my shin, oh my shin, oh my shin, oh my shin. And then the other people that also didn't have the gift that were also freaking out that we weren't going to make it, um, I taught them. And so then we all did it together. We sat in our little area, and we all had our own language speaking in tongues, and we totally fit in and, um, for a while. And, uh, and, and that's what I did. You know, I just tried to figure out a way to fit in because I couldn't stay in any circle for very long. And I didn't know why, you know, I didn't, I did know that there was just, you know, we all talk about, it didn't, um, uh, we all talk about here where it just didn't fit in, right. Felt different, um, felt like the other or something like that, you know, and for me it was no different. Um, and I couldn't stay, uh, in any circle for very long. It was made fast friends, lots of best friends, and then had to move on. And uh, what I know today is what, that's, what that is about is that um, I was so uncomfortable. I didn't know who I was, and I couldn't afford for you to get to know me better than I knew myself. I just couldn't. As much as I wanted to be known, wanted to be loved, wanted to have connection, I couldn't afford it because I didn't know how to have that with myself. And, uh, and, uh, and so there was another issue that came up for me. Uh, while I was in my early 20s. And, you know, I'm not drinking, remember. I drank alcoholically now at 17, but now I'm not drinking uh, because I'm not going to be like you. And, um, and that's uh, my sexuality. Well, that didn't really go well also with the, the belief system that I was in. And it was something that I never talked about, wasn't going to talk about, but it was absolutely the thing that I drank about um, because I loved God. 
And, uh, and I wanted to, if there was one place that I should have been able to fit in, it should have been that, right? And I sincerely felt, I didn't have any judgment, and I still don't to this day. It just felt like I wasn't, it was, a, it was a me and God issue. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't a me and you issue. It was a me and God issue. And so I worked really, really hard trying to, you know, get the points together uh, to get into heaven, to get on that side. And, uh, and I just knew that I wasn't going to. And there was this one night, and, and I, I'll never forget this night, because to me, it was, uh, to me it was the night, if there were ever to be a relapse up until now, it would have been this night, right? Because at 17, I didn't drink, and then now I'm in my early 20s, and, um, and I need a drink. Um, but I don't know it. What I think is I need peace. And the first thing that comes to mind, the book tells us that we get an immediate sense of ease and comfort that comes at once, immediately following a drink. Right? And I've been working really hard up to that point, and still in sobriety will catch myself seeking an immediate sense of ease and comfort that can immediately be come following a thought. Because even though that I don't drink today, I haven't had a drink for 22 years, I still have an active obsession of the mind. And if I'm not careful, I will find an immediate sense of relief with a thought. It's the thought that's dangerous. It's the thought that I have to run by my friends. The thought and the idea. Some people call it running on self-will. You know, for me, I just have to remember I got to keep talking. I got to keep talking, right? Anyway, so my best idea that night that came immediately was a bottle of wine because Jesus drank wine, and so I figured it was okay. Even though I had signed a contract saying I wasn't going to drink alcohol or smoke or darken the doors of a bar or cuss or anything like that. Um, but Jesus drank wine, so this one was good. And, um, and so I got a bottle of wine, and just like that bottle of champagne, I drank the whole bottle, and I slept like a baby for the first time in years, in years. And from that night to uh, three years later, uh, there wasn't a day that went by that I didn't drink. And I started to do some other things. I ended up, I did get kicked out of the church, and that was okay, because when, uh, as a musician, I went to play music in the bars, and that's when I found unconditional love, you know, and uh, God in a bigger way, and, um, and connection, you know, and it was all perfect, because nobody was going to stay in each other's lives for a long time, you know what I mean? It was just all temporary, and that's all I knew, and so it was absolutely perfect for me, um, except that I still had that longing, you know, inside that I don't belong even in that. Um, and so I drank and, uh, I did other things, uh, uh, and, uh, the other things were really the purpose of those things, um, were simply to not drink because I knew that if I couldn't stop drinking, I was going to be one of you. And, um, and so I tried other things simply to not drink and not a day went by that I would, um, not drink. I drank every day for three years. And then, uh, you know, I'm from Arizona and this is all taking place in, in Tucson at this point. And, um, uh, you know, uh, the gun laws in Arizona were a little, I don't know what they're like today cause I haven't been there for, you know, a couple of decades, but at the time as you could have a handgun, uh, and as long as it was exposed and, and, uh, Carson's, we were gunslingers. We were just cowboys, you know, roots from Texas. And my mom's from Illinois, but the Texans won. And, um, and, uh, and I had this 38 and I was always, um, coming out in that last year of blackouts with the 38 many, many times, uh, frequently in a week, I would come out of a blackout with a 38 against my head. And, you know, I want you to know that for the first at least 12 years, 12 to 15 years of my sobriety, I would just forget to tell that part of the story because it really means nothing to me. And I know that sounds uh, bizarre, you know, um, but that's not as important as my bottom, which I'm about to tell you. But I suppose I should qualify a little bit in case that's something you relate to, right? I mean, in Tucson, there's this... Uh, I love to be outdoors. There's this great mountain called Mount Lemon. And in the middle of the night, I would, um, a couple of times, came out of a blackout with my 38 against my head. I'm seeing the Tucson city lights, and I just, you know, oh, well, turn around, climb back up the mountain to get to my car and come back down. And it happened frequently. Sometimes outside of Tucson, I'd come out of the blackout. You know, I've got my 38 in the car. I already know this is an old story. You know what's happening. Uh, I find the glow of the city lights, point my car in that direction, go back and go to bed. Um, you know, the, 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 
the torment in my mind uh, was the heaven and hell thing. You know, uh, when I had DTs, it was uh, God coming out of one of the walls and the devil coming out of the other, and they were arguing over me. Um, and it was it was a thing that I drank about. And um, and uh, uh, but the night that I had uh, asked for help went. It's very very simple. It just went like this. Um, as usual, you know, there were times that uh, I got so loaded that I couldn't move my body. Um, this particular night, I'm on the floor in my apartment, and I can't move my body. But my mind is stone sober. And, uh, and I had not experienced that before. And I'm really, really wimpy. I want you to know that. Um, and so, like, it sometimes only takes one little thing, one little pinch, and I'm like, uh, you know, I surrender. Um, and this was that. You know, uh, my body was drunk, so drunk I couldn't move, but my mind was so sober. My moment of clarity wasn't that, oh, I have a problem, because I had had that already. My moment of clarity was why I drank, why I needed to drink every single day, and that was to get away from me. That was being with me was unbearable. And definitely that night, to be with me that with that amount of clarity, knowing that the reason I drank was to be away from me, was unbearable, scared the crap out of me and, uh, and enough. So for me to make a phone call to my, uh, my sober mom after not speaking with her for three years, uh, and, um, and asking for help. And I didn't even have to say why. And, uh, uh, you know, we all know when someone's drinking, I didn't think she knew. And, uh, and so she helped make some arrangements for me to go to detox here in California. So I come here to California and I go through detox, but I'm scared. I'm, I'm scared to join you because I hate you. And I'm scared to, um, to go home. And so I go to sober living. And, um, and sober living was great. You know, they, they gave me, you know, the rules where I go to three meetings a week. And the three meetings a week uh, could be anything of my choice, including a Bible study, which I didn't go to because now I'm just this complete sitter. And so... You know, but I've got any of the 12 steps to go to, and it's really awesome, so I don't, I don't see you for a second. You know, I'm not going to go to AA for a little while, except for a Saturday morning um, meeting that served the best donuts and coffee. And so um, there was a group of us that went to that one. But then they made me the sober living manager, and that was really great. And I'm convinced this day, especially after several inventories, that the reason why I did stay sober was because I ran those people's lives. You know, I would uh, change the rules and make new rules, and then you'd get in trouble for not following following the rules and then I changed the rules again and then you'd get in trouble for not following her and then I changed the time that we were going to have our house meeting and you had to be on time it was just crazy I was that crazy house manager um, but I was that's how I was staying sober was basically <laughs> running your life and then um, and just showing up to my meetings I would get a sponsor and I would do one two and three and then I would get a new sponsor and uh, and then I would do one two and three and I would get a new sponsor and I can only remember four of them but I know that there was more um, and, uh, I had a sponsor at one point that I really liked her. She was an NA and, uh, I really liked her. She was real, real nice. And, uh, we went and, you know, would have lunch together and stuff like that. And, uh, she seemed really cool. And, um, and so I thought, you know, for once I'm going to tell my story. And so I do the four step, you know, I write it out and I read it to her and it takes 12 hours. I know some of you just looked up like I had lost you until then. And then, uh, 12 hours. I read it to her. She's too tired, I guess, to finish. And she's like, okay, I'm going to come over tomorrow and we're going to finish this. And she comes to my house and I'm like, okay, I don't know where I've read everything. I feel good. And so she comes over to the house the next day, the sober living house. And she comes in and, and she pulls out this piece of paper and she starts reading me this, these things. And I'm like, what, wait, what are you doing? And she says, this is your part. And I'm like, what do you mean? What, what do you mean my part? I'm like, what are you talking about? And she's like, this is your part. And so I fired her and kicked her out of the house because she clearly <laughs> was not listening to my story. I had zero connection to any of that and got a new sponsor. One, two, and three, got a new sponsor. And in the meantime, um, so, well, actually, then after two years of, of running my life that way, not drinking, being dry, um, I broke my hand on the sober living director's face, and so I had to move. And then I moved to Long Beach. And, uh, and I was hiding out in that point, not knowing I was hiding out. Thought I was being a, an active member of um, CA, which is Cocaine Anonymous. Be patient with me that I mentioned that in an AA meeting. And, uh, and at 18, 18 months previously, uh, I was asked to speak 
And uh, God, I just felt like a rock star. And I, I, I did like a 10 minute pitch in Cocaine Anonymous um, at 18 months. And I kept it, you know, general in a general way, what it's like, what happened and what it's like now. But I want you to know that I've never seen cocaine in real life, ever. <laughs> Because I will go to any length to fit in, and I will go to any length to not become one of you. You get my point? And those are all great ideas that come. Great, you know, a sense of ease and comfort comes immediately after drink, for me, sometimes a thought, right? And so my good friends in CA recognized uh, some of the issues And uh, my very best friend at the time, Mark Tanaka, came to me and he said, Tina, you have to go to AA. Because at this point, I had a cast on my hand. You know, I got kicked out. And my life is no different. And he said, you need to go to AA. And so I thought, all right. So I went to this Wednesday night uh, meeting, this random meeting in Long Beach. And there were about 10 people there. And we're sitting in a circle. And everyone had to share what it was like, what happened, and what it's like now in a matter of three minutes, right? And the problem was is I didn't know. And that was my second moment of clarity, but the biggest one was I didn't know. I didn't know what the truth was. I'd been lying for so long. I'd been rearranging the story for so long so that I can fit in with you. You know, my whole entire life I've been rearranging the story. You know, I've been, uh, you know, and that's not even based on my uh, perceptions, right? I mean, then I've got the perception problem of what I think is reality, and, uh, and I just can't, I can't give my story in three minutes, you know. And, um, and so uh, my friend Mark had actually picked a sponsor for me. And so I had taken that direction. And I went to um, a place where I met her, asked her to be my sponsor, and I went through the steps. And the thing that shifted for me was I was sitting now in Alcoholics Anonymous, desperate. I wanted what you had. What you had was this in my mind at the time. You could sit in a meeting with a bunch of strangers or people that you knew, and you seemed relatively comfortable. And when you weren't comfortable, you talked about it. And you had friendships. You had friendships that seemingly got you through, you know, decision-making processes or supported you in things that were going on in your life. And if you looked like someone who didn't have friends, you were still supported by the meeting. There was something that you got by showing up. You were getting married. You were getting divorced. You were going through births. You were going through deaths. You were going through it all. You were losing jobs, finding jobs. You know, you were having issues within the meeting, and you were having solutions within the meeting. And, and all of those things, it's called life. And I wanted it. I didn't even know that it was called life. I didn't know it was that simple, but I wanted what you had. And I knew that what, uh, in order to get a taste of what you had, I had to find my part. So I was willing to do my inventory again. And I was desperate to know my part. And you know what? I didn't see it. I didn't see it, but I was willing to see it. And so what my sponsor told me was my part, you know, is what became my part. And I grew into it. And as far as the God thing, like when I came here, you told me the doorknob could be my God. And I didn't believe you. You were nuts. You were nuts then, and you're nuts now. With all your different gods, it's just nutty. It's nuttyville. It's cray-cray in here, right? And, uh, and you're all going to hell, by the way. And, uh, and that was what I was thinking, right? And I'm going with you. And, and because it's like having a red car. The car's red. And you're telling me, paint it any color you want, Tina, but we've got to live by rigorous honesty here. And I'm like, I don't get it. And so what I did was I had to shelve that question. I reserved the right to ask it later, and I did. I asked it later. I reserved the right to ask that because I wanted what you had. I decided to actually do what you do because that sober living director that I broke my hand on had told me, you know, if you do what we do, your skin will fit. And that's why I was so mad at him because no one had ever put in one sentence how I lived my whole life and how I felt from a little girl to that day, was that my skin doesn't fit. I couldn't bear for you to even look at me. And now I wanted to be able to know what it was like to want to be on the planet, you know, for a higher percentage than I didn't want to be on the planet. And so I did the steps with her, you know, and then I did the steps again, and then I did the steps again, you know, and, uh, and over the years I've done the steps several times, you know, and, um, and I've had... Uh, you know, that sponsor uh, stopped going to meetings, you know, after a while, but she gave me my foundation in Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, then I got another sponsor who taught me structure 
in Alcoholics Anonymous, who taught me how to get commitments and show up and, and how, how solutions just naturally happen in my life. As long as I'm showing up to my meetings, I'm taking commitments, I'm putting my hand out, I'm doing that. And so I learned structure, and that, that changed my life. You know, and the sponsor that I have today I've had for 13 years, and, uh, and she's taught me, you know, more and more about just daily living, about how to apply uh, this God of my own understanding, you know, and has taught me how to allow God to change and morph. And, you know, it's really the same God, just uh, kind of different. I know that doesn't make any sense, um, but it just happened, you know. And now it's kind of like I got, I got, no pun intended, I got a rainbow car. <laughs> <laughs> that that was only funny to me, but it was funny. <laughs> Anyways, but uh, but the car can be any color; it doesn't really matter. It can have three wheels, two wheels; it just doesn't matter, you know. Because what I see now, what I know now, is that uh, you know, for a while, you had to become my higher power. The very thing that I hated, the very thing that I hated, had to become the very thing that I trusted the most. That you guys have told me believe that you believe, and that's what I did. I just believed that you believed. You know, and then I became part of you, and then I fell in love with you. And now I see God in you. Um, today, you know, uh, it's always, uh, I always hesitate, today I've got a good life. You know, I do. And a lot of speakers say that at the end. And I think the reason why is because, you know, or when people are sharing their story, it's because you get to this place where you just told everything and you're like i'm at a place where it's like i'm filled with gratitude how can i not be filled with gratitude after i've just reviewed you know my whole life you know i've had 22 years of not drinking you know but i have had a lot of these years have been filled with laughter you know my mom um my, my mom was going to come visit me uh, with that first sponsor uh and my brothers were saying don't do it she'll she'll tear you up and i would have but I was listening at that point to my first sponsor, and she said, uh, "She said when she comes, I want you to ask her for her story, and I want you to listen like you're just another woman in Alcoholics Anonymous." And so I did. And we uh, we were going to L.A. to look at the stars, you know, the the Hollywood stars and things like that. And I asked her while we were driving because I was uncomfortable, and she started to tell me. And we ended up somehow in a coffee shop, never made it to the stars. And I listened for a couple of hours while she told me her story forgetting that I was in that story, just one alcoholic woman listening to another. And it, there was a shift. And what shifted, not our relationship shifted based on a shift of my perception. You know, my perception shifted. And it's because of you, because there's many parents in here, and I've heard you share, you know, and I've, I've become friends with many of you. You know, and I have compassion and forgiveness for you, and I had compassion and forgiveness for her that day. Um, when she had 33 years of sobriety, 12 years ago, you know, she got cancer. And, uh, and when I got on the plane, uh, I called my second sponsor and, uh, at the time, and uh, I said, I don't know what I'm going to do without her. And she said, uh, you just show up. Show up like you've always been showing up. Know that when you show up, that you're showing up completely clean. And what that meant for me, it wasn't about just amends. It was that I loved her and I received her for who she had always been, not just who she was in that day. And I got to um, have the priv privilege of, of walking with her through, you know, that time to her transition for those last four months of her life. We all have... Um, experiences that just blow our minds. You know, um, I can't speak for you, but I can speak for me. The experiences that I have in Alcoholics Anonymous, I've changed so many different times. So I'm not the person that I was when I got here, but I'm not the person I was, you know, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago, even. You know, it's because of you. So when I say I have a good life, you know, obviously I mean it. You know, I'm not going to tell you about trips that I've gone on and cars that I own and things like that. And, and that's great if, you know, if that'd be great if that were the truth. But, <laughs> but the truth is I have a good life. I love my life today. I sincerely do. And I especially love my place in this life. I love myself and I love you. And there's nothing you can do about it. And I don't really care. 
Most important to me is I can walk on the planet, and most days does not matter who's looking at me. So thank you for that. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.